Welcome back. We're about to embark on the third part of our tour of St Michael's Church here in St Albans, a small city just a few miles north of London. Our focus is this building here around me, but if we can read one church, then we can read many churches. The layout and contents of St Michael's are similar to what you'll find in other churches all around the world. And if we can understand what's going on here, then we'll have a better appreciation of how Christians use their holy places all over the globe. Last time we were thinking about the main body of the church, the nave, this area all around me, where Christians gather in praise of God and to pray to him. We're now going to head to the front of church to think about the central Christian ritual known as communion. In heading towards the front of church, we are turning to face east. St Michael's, like many churches, faces the east. I suppose it's a bit like the Muslim tradition of turning towards Mecca to pray. However, although Christians do reflect on the Holy Land where Jesus lived, died and rose again, that's not why we face east in prayer. Christians face east because they are turning towards the rising sun. We don't worship the rising sun, of course, but it is a symbol of Jesus' resurrection at Easter, his life-beating death, light conquering darkness. Here at the East End of Church, we celebrate that service of communion, sometimes also called the Eucharist or Mass. On the night before he died, Jesus took bread and wine and commanded his followers to do the same in his memory. And he said that when they do this, he will be present with them. Christians have been obeying Jesus' command and meeting him in and through the bread and wine of communion ever since. The largest and oldest Eucharistic vessels we have here at St Michael's are these beautiful pieces of silver from the 1730s. We get them out at big festivals like Christmas and Easter. Now, Jesus' Last Supper was a Jewish Passover meal, the Passover being a special symbolic meal which Jews celebrate once a year. It reminds them of the rescue which God gave to their forebears from slavery in Egypt to freedom and life in the Promised Land. The Passover is a symbol of salvation, and that's what Jesus says communion should be for his followers, is to remind them of the rescue which he wins for them on the cross. Quite what's going on in communion, however, has been a matter of discussion among Christians. Is his body and blood present in a physical or a spiritual way? And is his presence in communion something which to us is past, present or future? This is big stuff, a matter of awe, wonder and mystery. But as we'll also see, it's been a matter of considerable disagreement among Christians for many years. If baptism is the point at which Christians become members of the church, communion is our badge of ongoing membership. Sometimes this is something with which we grow up, and here at St Michael's we admit children to communion from the age of seven. Or it can be something to which people turn in later life. We're going to hear now from Nick Herbert, about what recently brought him to baptism as an adult and why communion is of ongoing significance to him. I find the words of the communion service I attend elegantly spare, yet within them there is so much to think of. These words in particular, part of the prayer after communion has been taken, always resonate with me for two reasons. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Firstly, to me, these four short lines are powerful words of unconditional love. They talk of a God who reaches out to us through Jesus, however distant we may be from him, and however short of his expectations we may fall. It's as if, through Christ, God rescues us and brings us to a place of safety. I think of it as a kind of ongoing search and rescue operation. 
But there's another reason why these words have so much significance for me personally. For some reason, which was never explained to me, my parents didn't have me baptised as a child. And, although God has always been central to my life, and I've always readily recognised the many interventions he has made on my behalf, because of this oversight, I eventually came to feel disconnected from the church, believing that I didn't and couldn't properly belong to it. And so I prayed privately elsewhere, and for many years that was in the churchyard here at St Michael's. It suited me too because I felt I was living in a society that was increasingly hostile to Christianity. Practising my faith in the shadows felt like a good move at the time. Then a few years ago, at a time of great personal crisis, I was the beneficiary of this very same search and rescue operation that God does so well. Through Christ, God reached out, met me, and brought me to this place of safety. It was as if God had personally embraced me and led me inside his own home, just when I needed him the most. My spiritual journey to where I am today has taken some time, but at Easter 2018, I was finally baptised and confirmed in St Albans Cathedral. I was 62. For me, participation in Holy Communion, that eternal echo of the Last Supper, brings Christ's ministry amongst us into sharp focus and into my everyday life. It reinvigorates my faith and renews my relationship with God. But most of all for me, it will always be a service about belonging and about being a Christian out in the open, not in the shadows. Whatever church you're in, the furniture used during the communion service tells you a lot about the theology of that particular place. The main table used for communion here at St Michael's is made out of wood. It looks a bit like a dinner table. Indeed, I suspect when it was made around 400 years ago, it was a dinner table. Like the pulpit seen in the last session, it may have been a gift from the Grimston family at Gorhambury. The asymmetry at the top shows that it has been reduced in length, and the plinth underneath indicates that it has been raised up. These changes adapted a domestic table at which people once sat into a communion table where the minister now stands. The use of a wooden dining table like this emphasises the church as family and communion as the shared meal which affirms a common identity. Imagery like this is part of the Protestant heritage of St Michael's and of the Church of England more widely. Protestant ideas and practices flow down to us from the 16th century revolution known as the Reformation. The English Reformation is often associated with King Henry VIII. In reality, although Henry secured the independence of the Church in England and Wales from the Pope in Rome, it was his children, Edward VI and Elizabeth I, who were responsible for rolling out a comprehensive programme of Protestant ideas and practices across the country. As part of this programme, wooden tables like this were installed into churches. They had the effect of emphasising communion as a family gathering of Christians in each parish. In this tradition, communion is an act of praise and thanksgiving. It recalls Jesus' Last Supper and crucifixion. And through it, he becomes spiritually present to the Christians who are gathered. If that wooden table tells us a lot about Protestant Eucharistic theology, can we find evidence in St Michael's of the sort of ideas that were around before the Reformation? Indeed we may. Up here at the very far east end of church you can see a wooden square. It's the door of a cupboard known as an ombre. And this would have been put in before the Reformation to hold bread and wine reserved, left over, during the communion service. And it reflects the Roman Catholic idea that Jesus is physically present in the Eucharistic elements. Even more fascinating than the ombre now above my head is what we find down here on the floor at the very east end of the church. 
Until a few years ago, this area was covered up by a ghastly piece of red carpet. The carpet, however, had become a trip hazard, so we had a good reason to remove it. What we found underneath took us all by surprise. This is a medieval altar stone. Communion would have been celebrated on this before the Protestant Reformation. We know that this is a medieval altar because it is marked with five crosses, one in the middle and one at each of the four corners, although the one here behind me on the right hand side is obliterated. Five crosses like this were standard markings on medieval altars, one for each of the wounds which Jesus received on the cross. Originally the stone would have been fixed at table height against the east wall of the church. From here, it would have been removed on the orders of King Edward VI in 1550. Quite what happened immediately after that is unclear. However, some years later, it was flipped over and reused as a tombstone within another part of the church. This tombstone was itself removed during a reordering in 1866 at which point the original Eucharistic function of its other side was rediscovered. The stone was then relayed, original face up, here against the east wall as part of the Victorian reordering. The survival of altar stones like this into the 21st century is quite unusual. Professor Eamon Duffy, an international expert on the Reformation, once advised me that only about 1 in 20 of the churches like St Michael's which predate the Reformation still have intact medieval altar stones. The reason why King Edward wanted rid of stones like this is because they speak of a very different Eucharistic theology than the wooden table we saw earlier. Stone altars are about sacrifice, in particular the idea that the communion service is propitiatory an offering to God which somehow adds to the victory that Jesus won on the cross against sin and guilt. Protestants understand the sacrifice of Jesus' death on the cross to be unique and complete, and communion for Protestants recalls and celebrates this sacrifice, but it does not add to it. That's why Edward and his supporters needed to get rid of stones like this. In many churches, altars and communion tables have been enhanced by the colour and symbolism of frontals like this one. To talk us through the colours of the church year and the ideas on this frontal, we've been joined now by Maggie Bedwell. Maggie is a parishioner of St Michael's and was part of the team which made this frontal a few years ago. The use of seasonal liturgic colours dates back to the 4th century and is used by churches throughout the world. A generous donation from Marjorie Osborne enabled us to design and make a new purple frontal. With a church of over a thousand years old, we decided a conventional design was appropriate and a team of six of us set to work. In the centre, you can see the ancient Cairo sign, the first two letters of the Greek Christos. Either side, surrounded by symbolic crowns of thorns, are the Alpha and Omega sign, the beginning and the end, and a design of three nails, reminding us of Jesus' terrible death on the cross. We had some material left over, and so we were able to make a, a drop for the pulpit, a veil for the chalice, and a purple priest's stole. Purple is the traditional colour for Advent and Lent, signifying repentance and looking forward. Each of these four seasons ends in rejoicing at Christmas and Easter, when you will see a white frontal, sometimes decorated with gold. This is also used for celebrations where there is a strong presence of Christ, such as ordinations, baptisms and confirmation, and major saints' days. Seven days after Easter Sunday, comes Pentecost or Whitsun and the colour changes to red. When the Holy Spirit descended on the Apostles it was said to be like flames of fire so red is appropriate for this time. Red is also used for commemoration of martyrs 
such as St Alban, as it signifies blood. A week later, the colour changes again to green for Trinity Sunday. Trinity, on Trinity, spring is at its height. The trees and plants are growing. Green is therefore for growth. When we think about big themes of the big themes of Jesus' life and teaching, and hope that we can grow in faith and understanding during the summer, before celebrating a fruitful harvest. This episode has been considering the story of two different communion tables and two different Eucharistic theologies, one Roman Catholic and one Protestant. And in seeing this, we've been reminded that the church changes. Indeed, the churches are always evolving. And that's because the needs of the community shift from one generation to the next. The Reformation was a particularly significant shift in belief and practice in this country. But this building has stood for over a millennium and it's seen development in its layout and use in almost every century of its existence. Some people find this idea of churches changing to be a massive challenge. It's a widely held misnomer that churches are fixed and immovable, museums to a bygone age. That has never been the case. The built environment of any church adapts to the contemporary needs of mission and ministry. The church is not an arm of the heritage industry, but it exists to proclaim and enact the message and love of God. Join me next time as we find out how St Michael's does this in the stories we see in stained glass.